guy's a cowboy, he'll hit you in a minute. And of course when he did, that there was bolts open and I guess cocking, they were cocking their rifles. They were pointing guns at people and everybody, Buzzkirk and Glenn and Dad grabbed him, you know, pulled him back and got him away. No, don't Ted, they're going to shoot, don't do that, you know, trying to stop this. And I think we came very close to having someone shot. Then they really started threatening, you know, and they... Question, did the redhead do all the talking pretty much? Anderson, pretty much, except once in a while the sergeant would, you know, chime in and make statements like that to other people in response to the redhead. But mainly, it was the redhead. Question, was there a name tag? Anderson, yes sir, there was. His name was Armstrong. And I'm not sure if I know that from having read it or know that from remembering it and now being able to read it in my memory or if someone said that to me. But his name was Armstrong. It was right here on his uniform. Question, but he chased you guys away pretty quick? Anderson, yes, yes he did. And they herded us up like cattle and we were just up the arroyo back in the direction we came from over the protest of this Dr. Buskirk who said, no, no, we've got to go the other way. We came from over there. I don't care where you came from. Get your ass up the arroyo. And they ran us up the arroyo and... Question. So you get to your car again? Anderson. Oh, right. Now they took us up the arroyo and just over the hill we came down. They broke us off and moved us up the hill. Now this whole time, no one has ever frisked us down, no one has ever checked our pockets to see if we picked up any of this material, and this girl, Agnes, still had that stuff in her pocket, and some of the other students had stuff. To my knowledge, up to that point, they had not been searched. Whether they did so afterward, I don't know. They never searched us, ever. They ran us back up the hill, and when we got to where the car was parked, where Dad had parked the car up there, there's a jeep with a guy sitting in the back, and there is a mounted machine gun in the back of this jeep and all these soldiers. The jeep pulls out, we're told to get in the car, we follow the jeep, and the soldiers go with us all the way back out to the highway. When we get back out to the highway, they set us right there. They wouldn't let us out of the car, they wouldn't let us move forward. I don't know whether they were making a decision or what. When we got out to the highway, this place was absolutely full of military personnel, military equipment. There was airplanes sitting out there that had landed on the highway. Question. Did you see any airplanes when you were back at the site? Anderson. Yes, there was airplanes in the sky, but nobody thought much about. You know, I don't think anything about it. I was used to airplanes being in the sky, having been raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, the home of the Norden bomb site, you know. The sky was always full of military aircraft at night. And when we get back onto the highway, there's observation aircraft, you know, high-winged aircraft. And there's one of what I know now to be a C-47 setting there. And how we didn't hear that land is beyond me. And how he landed, well, of course, I guess you could land it if you were a good pilot out there as there were no poles or anything. And it was... They had torn the fence down on the north side of the highway and all this equipment was setting back up there. The plane was up there and they were taking stuff out of the plane. There was military ambulances and there were trucks with like wreckers, cranes on them. And there was tankers like maybe had fuel or water in them. There was just, everywhere you looked there was military. Question, a major recovery operation? Anderson. Yes, it looked like an invasion force. It really did. And they were all wearing these light khaki uniforms. They didn't look like, you know, olive drabs. They were light khaki and they all had the same patch over there. That kind of blue funny patch with the circles on it was on his shoulder. And a lot... Question. Do you have a clue as to where they came from? Did your brother or your uncle? Anderson. No, I don't know where they came from. No, I don't think anybody ever ascertained that. There was a lot of MP patches, and some of them were wearing nightsticks off of these webbed utility belts. They had nightsticks, and they had 45s and holsters, you know, the automatics, full holsters. And these were the people that were giving most of the orders. They had the road barricaded off out there, and we sat there for a very long time, and, you know, we were getting thirsty and everything. And we asked if we could go back to Horse Springs to get some water. 
oh, no, no, you can't through there. And right after that, they said, now you just turn around and you head out of here now and you go to Socorro. And this is the redhead again. Keep your mouth shut, just keep going and don't look back. Well, as we drove away, you know, Dad, the hell with it, we'll go to Magdalena. We'll get water in Magdalena. You know, because that's where John Trujillo lived, a relative of Ted's. And so as we drove away, I was looking out the back window and I could see Dr. Buskirk and his kids and that guy. The guy in the pickup was standing there and this Dr. Buskirk was doing just like this in this red-headed officer's face. And he kept pointing back behind him and I guess that meant, you know, we've got to go back that way and he was fed up with this guy or something and he was shaking his finger in his face when they were yelling at each other and that's pretty much the last I saw of the whole situation. I don't know what happened after that, because we just kept going. End of section 12. Recording by Aaron Bennett. Section 13 of The Roswell Report. Case closed by James McAndrew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Bennett. The Roswell Report, Case Closed by James McAndrew. Appendix C, Part 2, Interviews. Transcript of Interview with W. Glenn Dennis, a Roswell Army Airfield Hospital. Footnote. W. Glenn Dennis, Interview with Carl T. Flock, November 2, 1992. End of footnote. Question. You started getting calls from the base mortuary officer, is that right? Sometime in the afternoon on some day in July, 1947. Dennis. Right afternoon, yeah. Question. Do you recall, was that before the story appeared in the Roswell Daily Record? Dennis. I don't know. I'm sure it was. I can't honestly say, but I don't think the paper came out until the next day. I don't think. I'm just assuming that. Question. I understand. When things like that happen to me way after the fact, I try to remember, and I wasn't sure if you had any recollection or not. It was the base mortuary officer who called you, not any of the MDs out there. Dennis. No. Question. He was just... The mortuary officer was just the guy, Dennis. We used to have a standing joke. What did you do that was so bad that made you the mortuary officer? Question. Exactly. Dennis. He wasn't a doctor or anything, but he was an officer, and he was probably some old boy that was trying to figure out something to do with... We used to all have them come in, even the officer himself, say, God, I didn't know I screwed up that bad. Question. Was this a guy you'd worked with before? Somebody you knew real well? Dennis. No. Those guys come and go. Question. I realize that. You don't remember what his name was or anything like that? Dennis. No. I'm like Bob Shirky. I think if I would see it or heard it or something, I might. Those guys, they were in and out. The mortuary officer, usually they would appoint some sergeant or somebody. The only time the doctors were involved is when you'd have an embalming inspection or dress inspection where the doctors came in and examined the body to make sure everything was right. You had another inspection to make sure their dog tags, make sure all the metals and everything. They always had two crews of inspectors. The doctors were only involved in the cause of death or the autopsies or identification process, dental charts and all that. After they did their work, then a doctor would always come in and make sure the body was embalmed because they knew more about it than the other people. But they were involved before, you know. Question. The reason they contacted you was because Burt Ballard's funeral home up here had a contract with the base, right? Dennis. Yeah. Question. You worked for Burt for a lot of years, didn't you? Dennis. Yeah, a long time. Question. When did you first go to work for him? Dennis. I went to work for him. I was hanging around the funeral home when I was like a freshman in high school. I'd want to make some extra money. I'll give you 50 cents to watch the hearse. I knew his daughter real well. We were all in school together. That's where I really got involved in the funeral home. I just kind of worked my way into it. 
question. He basically taught you the trade and all that? Dennis. Oh yeah, my folks weren't in the funeral business. Question. The reason I was curious about it was because when I went back, I'm one of those guys that goes to Washington and then gets fed up and leaves and swears I'm never going to go back and then I go back anyway. But the last time I went back and did that, I shared a townhouse with a guy for a while who was a mortician from Michigan. But he had to go through all this formal training and all this rigmarole. Dennis. No. That started in... Inaudible. Maybe you don't want to hear this, but I was in the ninth grade and this teacher was going around and wanted us to write a composition on what we wanted to be when we graduated from high school. What were our future plans? I was kind of a wise guy, I guess I must have been, but I said Undertaker, and I don't even know why. All the girls squealed, so I got a little attention. Then she said, okay, if that's what you want to do, then you've got a week. You bring me your composition. I want to know why you want to be an Undertaker. So I went to the funeral home. They didn't have any books in those days or anything, but that's where I went. That's why I got involved in it, started. Question. How long were you in that business before you... I know you ran the Wortley Hotel up in Lincoln, New Mexico. Dennis. Oh, that was after I retired. Question. Oh, I see. You retired from the mortuary business. Dennis. Oh, yeah. I was in the funeral business 33 years. Question. All the time with Ballard? Dennis. Oh no, I had my own funeral home over in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and one in Socorro, New Mexico. Question. Oh, okay. Speaking of that, do you know Norman Todd or his family? Dennis. His dad and I took the state board together. He was at Clovis, New Mexico. Norman's his son, isn't it? Question. Yeah, he's a lawyer over in Las Cruces, New Mexico. His. Dennis. Wasn't his dad the funeral director in Clovis, New Mexico? Question. I think so. The reason I know him is because Mike Cook, who is Steve Schiff's press secretary, and he have been friends ever since they were in kindergarten together. It turns out that Iris Todd, I guess his stepmother, is the niece of Loretta Proctor. So talk about small world. You got these calls from the mortuary officer who was asking you all these questions. We don't have to go back through all this. Then at some point you decided to go out to the base. What took you to the base? Dennis. At some point I didn't decide. That's not correct. Somebody wrote that, but I don't think it's right. The way I ended up out at the base later, we had the ambulance service. The way I got it, the ambulance service, I got a call was an airman that was hurt. I took him to the base. The best I remember, he wasn't on a stretcher or anything because he walked up the ramp and he sat up in the front seat with me. So he weren't real bad and weren't dying. Anyway, this guy walked in, I walked him in. Where I usually parked the ambulance, there was a field ambulance there. I had to go back up to the front. The airman and I walked up the ramps. That's why I went to the base. Question. The hospital in those days was apparently a complex of buildings, right? Like Bob Shirky said, like the officers club, they're all wooden barrack types. Question. So the building that's out there now, the rehab center, is a completely new building and had nothing to do with that. Shirky. No. Think of a long walkway, like a tunnel, attached to the front of a series of... Question. I know just what you're talking about. Dennis, with a 